Welcome, everybody. Um, welcome. This is the ninth and final Zoom workshop. Um, this is called Prescribed Fire in Tahoe and Nevada. Um, this Zoom presentation is part of the Lake Tahoe and Nevada Wildfire Awareness Campaign. Um, and now this campaign has been running um, from May through October. And we featured one to two Zoom workshops every month um, to increase the awareness of and uh, preparedness for wildfire. My name is Jamie Royce Gomes, and I am the manager of the Living with Fire program. And co-hosting with me is Amanda Malici. Amanda is the coordinator for the um, Tahoe Network of Fire Adapted Communities. Thanks for co-hosting, Amanda. Thanks for having me, Jamie. So um, I am going to just get into this. Um, oops, let's see, go back to the other page. Um, we're going to cover the agenda, um, and then we're going to um, you know, do some housekeeping. Um, we're going to do a pre-workshop poll just to gauge what your knowledge is and where you're from. Um, and then we will... Um, introduce the speakers. After the speakers, we will do a question and answer period. And then following that, we're gonna do a post-workshop poll. Um, we're just gonna measure what you learned, um, whether or not this was this series was useful. And um, we, we wanna measure who we're, we're talking to. So this is the screen that you're gonna see. Um, we ask that you please mute yourself. Um, it can be kind of distracting if you, you happen to leave your, your computer unmuted or your phone unmuted. And then um, I don't know if somebody sneezes or you know the doorbell rings or, or whatever, phone rings, um, it can help uh, limit those distractions. Let's see, um, we are asking people to please turn off your video just because it helps with streaming. Um, let me move my screen. Uh, if you want to ask questions, you are going to click the chat button and then you're going to arrow down and click on questions for speakers. Um, though you're going to type in those questions, those questions go to Megan, the Living with Fire Outreach Coordinator, and then she'll email them to me. And then during the Q&A period, we will ask those questions. Now, um, if you're not familiar with Zoom and you want to change your view, you'd click this upper right hand button right here um, to have the gallery view. You're going to see um, all of the participants in a grid like pattern. If you want to just see the speaker, then you'd click speaker. And finally, to leave the workshop, you'd click leave. Um, again, we're going to do a post workshop poll, um, and it's really helpful for our, our grant reports and, and other types of reporting. So please stick around for that. OK, and then we've got this. Um, if we were in person, I would have this posted up behind me. Um, it basically just states that extension programs are federally funded. Our programs are open to everybody. There's a USDA contact if you have any other questions. Um, and if you have any questions regarding this or, or any questions in general about the series or um, anything, you can always email us at lwf at unr.edu. Okay, now, um, Megan, would you mind starting the poll? Right now, we're going to get into the pre-workshop poll. Um, again, this is um, just measuring um, where you live. Um, it, it measures uh, your affiliation, uh, whether or not you consider yourself a, a homeowner or a landowner, um, if you're a part of a land management. And then we're going to ask just some simple terms. Um, can you define prescribed fire. Um, other questions are, um, do you know why fire management agencies use prescribed fire? So I'm going to leave this poll up for a few minutes so that folks can answer. And then I'll enter, I'll admit more people. And so just as a reminder, these polls are anonymous. Um, I will be sharing the results, but we won't see where, you know, your, your name on there. It won't say that, you know, um, 
Joe Smith lives in Oregon. Um, it's just going to say this percentage of the folks in our workshop live in Nevada, et cetera. It looks like people are still voting, so I'm going to leave it up here for a few more seconds. It's funny because every time I think that we're done, I see those little numbers move. Okay, are we done voting? I'm going to, nope. Oh, I was just about to click end poll and then we got some more votes in. Okay. Okay, I think everybody's done. I'm gonna click end poll. And I'm gonna share these results. Okay, it looks like 37% um, of folks live in the state of Nevada, not within the Lake Tahoe Basin. 15% um, live in California, not within the Lake Tahoe Basin. 33% um, live in the basin. 4% well, are from Oregon, 4% from Washington, and then we have 7% from outside of the United States. So welcome everyone. Um, it looks like a majority of folks here are homeowners at 63%. Um, we have some agency staff, land management folks, and others who categorize themselves as other. Okay, so it looks like 74% of attendees say that they are able to define prescribed fire. 19% um, say they can sort of define it, and 7% uh, said they cannot. Um, so it looks like 85% of folks um, understand why fire management agencies use prescribed fire. 11% sort of understand why, and 4% do not understand why. Um, and then the question, are you familiar with the planning actions that fire management agencies complete prior to implementing a prescribed fire project? 30% um, of you said yes, 37% said sort of, and 33% said no. And then last question, um, are you familiar um, of the, with the collaboration that fire management agencies have with um, local county and state air quality agencies? 48% said yes, 37% said sort of, and 15% said no. So I'm gonna stop sharing this poll. Um, And then I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, so this is just a, a, a general informational um, presentation on uh, prescribed fire. So we're just going to be reviewing what prescribed fire is, um, why it's important. And um, we're going to be reviewing some projects that are going on in the Lake Tahoe Basin and in the state of Nevada. So the first speaker that I'm going to introduce you Two is Duncan Leo. He is the Forest Fuels and Vegetation Program Manager, and he works with the U.S. Forest Service Humboldt Toyabe National Forest. So welcome, Duncan. Thanks for having me. Okay, so would you like help? Uh, would you like me to share your screen or, or do you want to um, share it? A little slow on the button clicking here, but I'll uh, pull it no up worries. here. And two seconds. Okay. All right. So it's good to good to hear that there was someone from Oregon. I grew up in uh, Southern Oregon and uh, interesting to, to see that here. Um, a little bit about myself. So Jamie introduced me. I'm the, I work for the U.S. Forest Service Humboldt to Abbey National Forest. I am the uh, fuels and vegetation program manager. So I have responsibility to manage the uh, budget, uh, coordinate and oversee um, information sharing with our uh, foresters and fuel specialists all across the state of Nevada, and then also a portion uh, of the Eastern Sierra in California. So you can see on the map, um, Humboldt Toabbey National Forest, if, if you're not aware, 
uh, spans across a good chunk of Nevada. Um, when national forests were first uh, organized uh, over 100 years ago, uh, many of the foresters were actually looking for the most productive lands um, with, with the goal of, of timber in mind. And, and when they came through Nevada, uh, these, these were the main areas that were selected to be under the, the national forest system. So we, we run from the Santa Rosa district north of Winnemucca, the Mountain City, Ruby Mountain and Jarbage district or districts near Elko, the Ely Ranger district uh, at the far east end of the state, uh, the Austin and Tonopah Ranger districts, uh, the Spring Mountains near Las Vegas, Bridgeport, and then the Carson uh, district. And you can see those on the map. Um, I guess, you know, maybe to, to bring this in more personal too, uh, more about myself, I've, I've been in the, the land management, uh, fuels, forester, civil culture, timber uh, arena as part of my career uh, since 1998. Uh, when I first started as a firefighter uh, for the agency. Um, so I'm, I'm very familiar with uh, lots of the management side of national forest management. I've worked uh, on the Humboldt to Abbey since 2014, 2014. And then prior to that, I also worked in the Lake Tahoe Basin for the Forest Service uh, from 2006 to 2014 and uh, spent some time uh, Northern California in the Lassen Plumas National Forest, as well as Arizona and New Mexico uh, near Flagstaff and Santa Fe. So um, I'm just gonna get moving in here to the presentation. The Humboldt Tribe National Forest uses prescribed fire. Um, we are 4 million acres outside of the wilderness. If you include wilderness, it's 6 million acres. So you can see all those areas across the map. Very diverse uh, vegetation types and wildlife habitats. Um, and, and like I was trying to emphasize earlier, um, some of the most productive mountain ranges um, across Nevada, and believe it or not, there's, there is water um, and diverse vegetation. So what is, so my presentation today, um, I wanna kind of paint a picture of, of scale, um, how we use prescribed fire on the Humboldt Tabi National Forest. Um, you know, first off, what it is, uh, why it's used, the benefits, some of the steps involved in, in the planning process. Um, we can't just go out and, and light a drip torch and start uh, burning. We, we do need to do uh, environmental analysis, public involvement, um, and consider the social, economical, and ecological uh, impacts for prescribed fire. Um, I'll also be sharing the types and classification, uh, kind of breakdown of prescribed fire, uh, how it's used, um, and how it can meet land management objectives. So of that 6 million acres that I just said, last several years, we've only used prescribed fire on a range of 2,000 to 8,000 acres. So on average, we're, we're burning 3,000 acres a year. Um, relatively small. So prescribed fire, my definition um, is the planned application of fire to the landscape to meet certain land management objectives. Oftentimes, when we're, when we're working in, in the urban interface uh, around communities, the, the, the main objective is to reduce the fuel loading uh, to promote uh, resiliency as well as safe and effective fire suppression response if we do get a fire. Uh, many times we use prescribed fire and it is um, meeting multiple objectives. So, so I'll bring it back to the, the social and the ecological uh, impacts or implications of prescribed fire. Um, prescribed fire in a planned situation versus wildfire, which is an unplanned situation. So the benefit of prescribed fire is that we can use the right type of fire 
at the right place and at the right time to meet those objectives compared to a wildfire where it's an unplanned situation. Generally, the conditions are, are fairly extreme and we have very little control at, at how we can uh, move fire or influence fire across the landscape. So based on the poll information, which is really helpful, um, you know, I gather there's a good portion of folks here that do understand uh, prescribed fire and, and why it's used and the benefits. Um, you know, just kind of listing off some of the benefits here, um, you know, reducing those hazardous fuels around our communities. Um, that's been a big focus, um, how we treat fuels, one of the major steps in terms of addressing the fuels situation is uh, using prescribed fire. Uh, prescribed fire minimizes spreads of insects and disease. Um, it also removes unwanted, it can be used to uh, remove unwanted species that threaten um, portions of the ecosystem, uh, provides forage for game, improves habitat for certain species threatened and endangered as well, um, brings back the the soil nutrient uh, uh, recycling process. Um, also promotes the growth of trees, flowers, and other plants. Um, humans have been using fire uh, for several hundred, if not thousands of years. Um, we're dealing with an altered landscape as, as I think most, most people uh, understand. Um, for a good portion of the last 50 or so years, we've been very successful at putting wildfires out and that has increased the, the loading of fuels across the landscape. It's altered the uh, function and processes of, of many of these ecosystems. And these ecosystems depend on fire to, uh, to regenerate, to, to uh, provide services to wildlife um, and, and the diversity that we see. So going back more to the, the economics and the ecology and, and also the social aspects of things, why and where do we use prescribed fire? Again, um, we can't just put fire across every acre of the landscape. We have many considerations to um, address before we even get to that point. Um, we, and, and you can see here in this slide, um, the, the term specialists, uh, normally in our planning process, uh, we look at a, a big landscape. We look at where, uh, where fire might be needed to meet those objectives that we talk about. Uh, so we have specialists who, who are an interdisciplinary team, um, including biologists, um, fuels and fire managers, foresters, um, and then also the line officer, who's generally the district ranger. This is the person that makes the decision. Uh, specialists get together and, and they look at all these factors, um, the location and the access. Um, many, many of the treatments we do, um, we have to break down our planning process by you know, where we can get people in there and um, you know, what, it, what it means to address the fuels. Um, Cost is another important factor. And in, in many cases, when we treat smaller acres, cost can, can go up. Uh, when we, when we tr uh, treat a large area or a large tract of ground, generally those costs go down and we can have more uh, benefit for uh, making our money go further um, using prescribed fire. Before we even get to lighting that drip torch again, in many cases, we actually have to do some pre-treatment activities. So generally first steps, we have to do environmental analysis and planning. Uh, that does involve uh, a public process as well as analyzing the effects of prescribed fire and, and even other fuels treatment activities across the landscape. So before we can light a fire, we may need to actually um, address, address each situation differently. 
um, we have to consider uh, the behavior of a fire if we were to light it, what that means, um, what that means for fire behavior and, and meeting those objectives. And oftentimes what we're doing is pre-treatment activities that may include thinning, uh, slashing, piling, and followed up by pile burning. Uh, enhancement of natural or existing features. Um, we have to consider those control features uh, in order to construct fire line, hand or mechanical line. Um, that's gonna be where we control um, prescribed fire on the landscape. So here I'm gonna go into the, the various types of uh, prescribed fire, um, starting with understory burning. So de defining that, uh, generally speaking, is, is we're using fire um, to reduce or burn the fuels component below a forest canopy. This is intended to remove um, the hazardous fuels from the forest environment, and, and you can meet many other objectives along the way in, in here. Um, this is used to mimic uh, naturally occurring fire at a, at a lower, generally lower intensity, where we retain the forest canopy um, in this situation, uh, the, the burning itself is, is generally low intensity. And what we see following is, is reducing the surface and ladder fuels that would then uh, create fire getting up into the canopies of the trees. Um, those other side benefits I mentioned, um, what you see in these situations is lots of grasses, uh, forbs, and other plants uh, sprouting up very successfully. Uh, in understory burning also, we use it to uh, promote regeneration of, of pine species. Pine species cannot regenerate in a thick uh, death layer. Um, they need that soil, um, that site to be prepped through, um, through fire to get to that point. So I kind of forgot to mention on the Humboldt Tohabi National Forest and, and mostly in Nevada, um, over two thirds of the forest is, is a pinyon juniper and sagebrush ecosystem. So broadcast burning is a tool used uh, on the forest, uh, primarily to control, um, I'm sorry, to, to burn the fuels where, where you know, there's no major canopy present. Um, it's used in these grasslands, shrublands, and, and woodlands to, to mimic fire across the landscape. Uh, large areas can be treated at a time. One of the things that we have to be very careful with in Nevada, uh, burning in these environments is actually um, what presence of cheatgrass, medusa head, or other invasive annuals exists. And um, in, in some cases, the fire prescribed fire itself may actually increase the, excuse me, the spread of, of those invasive annuals. So those are many considerations. Um, wildlife habitats, we have sage grouse habitats. Um, generally speaking, fire is a great threat to sage grouse and other habitats, but the proper application, low intensity, providing um, that regeneration of of those grasses, forbs, and sagebrush actually provides some diversity in the landscape itself. We'll see many instances of pile burning occur in the urban interface. Um, I'm sure many people have seen it um, across areas of Tahoe and Reno and Carson City area. And this is essentially arranging the fuels into piles, which then really allows us to have a, a greater uh, burn window throughout the year in order to dispose of, of the slash uh, that's created from thinning the forest. Prescribed fire is one of many tools that we use. Uh, however, as I said before, we do, we do some of those pre-treatment activities um, and prescribed fires generally one of the, the later steps involved in the general fuels reduction that we do. So we may, we may do some thinning, logging, 
chipping mastication uh, and other activities in order to rearrange those fuels to get to that desired, um, desired condition that we want. And then we'll follow it up with fuels reduction through prescribed burning, either as a primary treatment, um, as a maintenance treatment, or, or a final treatment involved in, in meeting those objectives. So as I mentioned before, you know, there's, there's benefits and objectives met. Um, wildfires are really eating our lunch here in the last several years. Um, we want to use fire on our terms, as I said, as opposed to uh, in the middle of August with 40 mile per hour winds involved in, um, in a wildfire situation. So part of the, the planning process involves um, writing a burn plan. And, and within these burn plans, it's uh, required through our policy um, to essentially model what the fire behavior uh, is gonna be under, under the conditions that we, um, that we want. And, and that's the prescribed fire um, parameters that consider temperature, humidity, winds, uh, the moisture, the vegetation, as well as smoke dispersal. The modeling itself gives us an idea on what those conditions are that will allow us to um, have a certain flame length or certain fire behavior. The modeling also allows us to determine what kind of resources we need. So I use the term resources, not natural resources, but actual fire suppression resources uh, the day of the burn, as well as, as holding the prescribed burn and then monitoring the burn um, before we uh, mop it up or call it out. So again, we get to determine those conditions and those parameters. Uh, generally speaking, um, before we even start burning, we're out there uh, with a weather station, um, monitoring the fuels conditions as well as the, the, the current and, and projected weather to allow us to meet those conditions. I mentioned smoke dispersal uh, because smoke is one other consideration we need to um, account for in our burn planning process. Um, the volume of smoke in some cases is, is irrelevant. We can burn a thousand acres in a day um, and produce a ton of smoke, but if that smoke is not moving, moving through an area or dispersing outwards, then that becomes a, an air quality problem that um, uh, generally we, we have to uh, mitigate through uh, burning fewer acres, shutting down the burn, um, or, or not doing the project at all. We also are required through our burn planning process to get permits from the either local county uh, air quality districts or through the state, through Nevada Division of, of Environmental Protection, um, in order to share the, with them our burn plan information and the type of information uh, for uh, smoke management in, in case uh, smoke becomes a problem. Uh, you'll see the graphic here on the screen. Um, this, this was a, a point in time in, in the fall of 2016. Uh, where you can see spot weather forecasts that were requested from the National Weather Service um, this given month. This gives you an idea on how much prescribed burning actually does occur uh, across the nation. There's that little gap in Nevada. Um, and then also, you know, not to not to get too wordy or, or, or bore you too much here, but you know, it's within our policy that we have to meet um, specific elements within our burn planning. Uh, I mentioned that we do have other laws and policies that we have to meet. Um, the burn plan itself is, is our, uh, our form, the PMS 484 form, um, basically is the template for um, all the information that we need to factor into a burn plan. We also have prescribed fire specialists that are uh, uh, that go through rigorous training and qualifications, and they 
they get to, um, depending on the, the complexity of the fire, the size, the uh, could, uh, where, where the project is actually um, in conjunction with the urban interface or outside of the urban interface, uh, they get classified in terms of their expertise and qualifications, and, and we call them uh, prescribed fire burn bosses. So I put this slide up because um, it, it, gets, it gets the conversation going. It gets people thinking of, of what's really needed. Um, as I mentioned before, on the Humboldt to Abbey National Forest, out of the 6 million acres, we're currently doing 2,000 to 8,000 acres a year. Um, we know based on uh, data, science, and research that uh, humans and, and other natural ignitions occurred across this landscape uh, at more than 100,000 acres a year. So in order to actually get ahead of, of the wildfire problem, we have to actually be scaling up some of these treatments. And, and that's why I mentioned that uh, wildfire, um, you know, the unplanned ignitions, those, those situations don't work out for us. But if we, if we get a chance to plan the ignition, have it a low intensity burn, uh, or in some cases later in the fall when, when we can manage um, the size of the, the prescribed fire and, and wait before that last snow or last rain event to, to shut it down, uh, we can get ahead of the problem. Um, overall, we treat uh, anywhere from 20,000 to 40,000 acres a year using those other fuels treatment uh, um, this other fuels treatment activities. So prescribed fire can be applied in, in those remote areas, in those areas where we don't have road access, in those areas where it's steep um, and we can't use mechanical methods of treatment. Um, that's where we can focus additional prescribed burning uh, under those desired conditions to, to get ahead of the problem. Um, there's some research here referenced um, on this slide, and then also UNR and other uh, research institutions um, have put out a lot of research that indicates that we need more prescribed fire. Um, put the plug in there because there are situations where these large wildfires have burned into a fuels reduction project or even a prescribed burn project. And the behavior of the fire has has been from the canopy, uh, crown fire and torching to then once it gets into the, the prescribed burn project, the wildfire behavior is actually a lower intensity surface fire, allowing firefighters to more safely engage or even minimize um, those activities um, and provide safety to the crews that are involved. Just kind of tying some of this all together, um, the planning process that's involved and the pre-treatment that's involved. Um, this is just a couple photos and, and slides here just showing um, a very simple basic um, fuels treatment that involved prescribed burning. But before we got to the burning, we had to rearrange the fuels through uh, thinning some of the brush and smaller, less healthy trees and then piling them. So you can see if you look at the, the middle of the photo here, there's a little pink flag. Uh, that's kind of your reference point. Uh, crews came in, uh, hand crews came in with chainsaws. Uh, they piled a lot of the, the brushy slash. The objective, as I mentioned, an objective before uh, was to work within the urban interface, reduce the fuel loading, allow for if a wildfire occurred, more safe, safer place to engage and prepare um, if there was any structure protection needed. So here's the photo again. And this I believe is actually outside of Reno. So hopefully no one here in the audience is, this is their house. Or if it is, then you can, you can uh, tell us how you think and feel about this. Here's the piling process. And generally speaking, we have to wait um, we have to wait at least a year for these fuels to dry enough to be able to burn them. 
and a very desirable time of year for pile burning is, is actually when we have enough moisture on the surface so that the fire stays uh, within the pile footprint. Um, in some cases, it is actually really nice to see creep surface creep on the on the ground to, to further reduce uh, the fuels. But a lot of pile burning does take place in the winter time where there's enough snow to keep the file fire in the, the pile footprint. And then here's the after after effect of of uh, this treatment. And that that concludes kind of the basic overview. Thanks, Duncan. You're welcome. Um, let's see. We'll stop your sharing. Um, okay, so now I'm going to, uh oh, I haven't un turned on my video camera. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, now I'm going to introduce um, Keegan Schaefer. He is the Wildland Fire and Fuels Division Chief of the Tahoe Douglas Fire Protection District. Welcome, Keegan. Thanks, Jamie. Um, like uh, Jamie said, I am the Fuels Chief, if you will, for unlike Duncan, 6 million acres of state uh, responsibility. Uh, of the small uh, district of Tahoe Douglas. And we basically, if you don't know where we live, uh, essentially it's from the casino corridor up to Glenbrook, kind of the southeast side of Lake Tahoe. So um, my presentation today kind of is more geared towards um, my area of expertise, which is the basin and, and, and uh, prescribed burning in the basin. And especially more specifically uh, to what I like to phrase as boutique burns or more surgical burns. So as a firefighter for a municipal department, um, it's our responsibility to protect our residents and our visitors to Lake Tahoe. Uh, that being said, I concentrate my burning mainly in the WUI or what we call the wildland urban interface. So again, smaller scale when it comes to uh, the scope of my burning. And uh, I'm gonna share my screen here. And we'll talk about what, what kind of burning I like to do that boutique type burning up here at Lake Tahoe. Excuse me uh, while I find my button, there it is. Okay, so uh, as you can see, as Duncan um, alluded to a lot in his presentation, uh, there, there's your typical pile when we're talking about pile burning in the prescribed fire realm. Uh, but you notice there that the casinos, the casino corridor there is in the backdrop. Um, so I, I, I think a lot about our smoke receptors in our district when we are doing a lot of these prescribed burns. You can imagine if I smoked out the casino corridor, not a lot of people would be happy with, with the controlled burn. So I want that good output. Um, and so we need to make sure that our smoke receptors, our schools, our, our public are well taken care of. And they also see the benefits of prescribed fire. So basically uh, here at Tahoe Douglas, we're lucky enough to have a division, a fuels division, wildland fire and fuels division. Um, and we employ young, strong, uh, young adults to go out and do some of this, this dirty work. Uh, but really, again, as I prefaced this conversation, we, we, we concentrate within the WUI, really close to those homes. So Duncan had some really good pictures of some of that fuel treatments underneath that house in, in Reno. Um, same thing up here. We're concentrating really close to the homes because as we know and we've seen in these wildfires it's that important zone around the houses that really need to be treated of course we need the large-scale burning to happen outside of the buoy before the fire makes it but the embers and everything that comes along with the wildfire you need to really concentrate in and around those homes so here's an idea of uh what my guys go out and do basically when they're not fighting fire this is done in the summer months uh, you can't always haul away and chip all this all this debris, uh, especially on some of the country that we work and live around. It's very steep and it can be very difficult to haul that stuff out. Of course, we can chip. It is one of the uh, uh, other options that Duncan had mentioned. But again, steepness of terrain, lack of personnel, sometimes it's just best to burn, especially on some some larger parcels here. You can see the crew out doing what I call the halo effect. 
we pick a structure and we pre-treat that area around it, making those piles and cutting all that brush and, and maybe some ladder fuels and some of the trees that create that excess fuels. Here it is in the same house in the winter uh, where we actually introduced fire. And you can see the conditions obviously changed. We got some snow on the ground um, and we were able to do so safely. This is a movie clip of that particular pile burn. And what I wanted to point out is it, it looks like a lot of fire and it really is, but conditions were really great for, for that burning of that day. Um, and like uh, Duncan said, um, sometimes when that, those piles creep together, we're creating that mosaic effect that a low understory fire uh, would produce on its own. So like Duncan said, we, we sometimes allow them to creep, creep together and create that mosaic. It also kind of simulates that, that understory burn that Duncan had mentioned. Hey, Keegan. Yes, ma'am. Um, if you're going to share your, uh, for a video, maybe, um, do you think that, uh, do you think that if you click the from current slide, it might show it bigger? Oh, is it really small on your end? Yeah. Uh, I saw you click from the beginning and it didn't work, so I don't know. Well, it's a really short clip. You're not missing much if you saw the past picture. Um, this guy here, it's basically, it was, it was just a live version of that. But you can tell, you know, how close we do get to those structures. Um, is, is fire always the answer next to these structures? No, not at all. But in this certain conditions, um, it absolutely can. Being a firefighter, first and foremost, we have something what we call the black line concept. And, and if we go out in the woods and we're creating fire breaks and whatnot, sometimes we'll utilize fire to clean up that line. And that's that black line concept. And firefighters will tell you, there's no safe line like a black line. So what are we doing here? But we're mimicking that black line concept around some of these homes that can utilize prescribed fire so, to get that, that fire effect. Um, I want to talk about conditions here. Obviously, in the Tahoe Basin, uh, we can be very dry or we could be very wet. And, you know, with, with, with what we're seeing in the weather, we're typically more on that dry side for longer. Uh, what does that mean for my program and my prescribed burn program? Basically means it's, it's hard to find those windows of opportunity. Now, again, Duncan talked about the differences in broadcast burning and pile burning. In Tahoe, and we do have a few days we can get a, a broadcast burn in, but my window stops shut pretty quick. Uh, it can be summer, summer like conditions, and then on a turn of a dime, you're in winter, and now we have snow on the ground. So you don't, don't really have that fall uh, window to get some, some broadcast burns off. So that's why pile burning, at least in my neck of the woods, tends to be uh, the more versatile. Here's a pretty dry condition pile burn. You don't see any resources, but I assure you they are there, that being that close to the home. Um, but being a fire department, you can see that we utilize fire hose and come with the proper equipment. Not to say that other fire agencies like Forest Service and, and BLM don't, um, but we're again, going back to that smaller boutique burns, working right out in people's homes. Uh, we don't take, we, we take the utmost precaution. See there, another one of my guys with hose installed before the burn. You know, one of the advantageous things, and I believe Duncan did mention this, is, you know, can we chip this stuff? Sometimes. Uh, but when we introduce fire to that homeowner's private yard, which is typically where we're working, not necessarily on the, the acres and acres of forest service that we have up here, although we can get contracted out, we're typically working on on private residence homes when we do these, these burns. But it stunts that growth, I've noticed. So after my guys go in there and they cut it out, what can happen potentially, but regrowth, right? Uh, but it will be low, lower, newer regrowth, which we prefer. Uh, but I've also noticed when we introduce fire that it stunts the growth, it takes longer to grow back. And like Duncan said, again, it encourages new growth of maybe some species that we do want there, not necessarily the old decadent manzanita, but maybe some of the uh, Mahalo mat, I've noticed that. And that's tough, really hard to get to grow in Tahoe, 
you can't plant it. You can maybe encourage it, but I have seen it grow back in a, in a lot of my burn piles, which is pretty cool. So uh, more on conditions, obviously. Uh, Duncan had a few pictures. We're prim primarily burning in snow. We're primarily burning in snow because we get a lot of it up here in the basin. Uh, you can kind of see, I wanted to point out this picture because along with snow and certain conditions, it's kind of a give and take, um, pretty smoky piles. Uh, when they're covered with snow, it inter introduces that moisture to that pile. And then as we burn it off, it kind of comes off as steam and smoke. And that kind of brings me to closing and talking about some of the obstacles. Obviously here in Tahoe, like I said in the beginning, I have very large smoke receptors. I got visitors coming by droves. I got residents and, and you know, the, for the casinos, for the ski and what have you. So I really have to take those opportune days Duncan talked about where the, where the wind is just right, the fuels are just right, the relative humidity is just right, and wind direction, especially important when I'm trying to get it out of my smoke receptors. So smoke's obviously one of the bigger ones that we deal with up here. Uh, and smoke can come with some tragic happenings. You know, this was a picture not up here in the basin, uh, but you know, when I, if we impact roads or whatnot, it could be really dangerous. So again, boutique burns, I keep them small and surgical. I know Duncan does a lot of acres per year. Uh, we're doing probably 200 acres of piles a year with my organization. And then of course, there's the weather as an obstacle. Sometimes in Tahoe, and this is, this is a picture I pulled off the internet. This isn't one of our pictures because if it was up here, you probably wouldn't see that pile at all. So you wouldn't even know it's a pile. So sometimes the snow and the weather definitely puts us out of, uh, out of business for the time being. Uh, but that's it. That's my presentation. I know it wasn't to the scope or scale of Duncan's, but again, smaller fire agency that manages fire. Um, that's my report. Awesome. Thanks, Keegan. Okay, so we're going to enter into the Q&A portion of this. Um, as a reminder, folks, um, please just, uh, if you want to ask a question, then you click the chat button, and then you look for questions for speakers, and then you type that in. Um, I'm not very good at multitasking, so this really helps. So somebody else can gather all those questions, then they'll email it to me, and then I can ask the questions. Okay, so the first question is, um, don't more forest areas need to burn the for the health and safety of the forest? If you have 6 million acres and burn 3,000 acres per year, it will take 2,000 years for the whole area. Don't we need more prescribed fires to reduce wildfires? Um, I'll stick this in the chat for everybody if, if you would like to see what this says. So it looks like a question for Duncan. Yeah, and I, I'm just looking at the chat as well. Um, see if I can get a, a good perspective here for you. Um, so we across the forest are starting a process of, of environmental analysis, looking at uh, conditional analysis for those 4 million acres um, under an environmental assessment. A part of what we're looking at uh, using some of the land fire uh, modeling, which essentially um, you know, vegetation uh, models um, across the forest broken down by all the different veg types. Um, we've done a departure analysis. So we've, I mentioned we've been very successful. Humans have altered the landscape. Um, European Americans, as well as uh, Native Americans prior, um, you know, altered the landscape. We, we, used, we used fire uh, prior, we stopped fire fairly recently. So part of our, our vegetation uh, analysis using land fire actually indicates how much departed we are. So where in certain ecosystems have we uh, missed a fire uh, return um, 
in, into that system. So in, in many cases, our, our lower elevation areas, those are the least productive. And I say least productive, meaning they're dry and the type of vegetation that, that grows on them um, is uh, you know, primarily uh, grass, forb, sagebrush. Uh, those lower elevation areas, if, when you're looking at across Nevada, those areas actually are starting to get too much fire. As we go up in the elevation gradient uh, across the, the mountains, for example, you get into the mid and higher elevations, those veg types, pinyon juniper, mixed conifer type forests, those areas are actually most departed, especially the mid elevation areas. So those areas we've missed uh, fire um, two or more times. Um, and so we need to get that fire back in there. So, um, sorry, I have teams open on, on my other line there. I'm getting all these chats. So our, our analysis is, is actually looking at the need to treat 100,000 acres a year using prescribed fire. That's a huge goal in order to get us caught up and uh, bring fire into a more uh, natural or historic, whichever term you'd like to use, uh, fire frequency, um, we need to be treating 100,000 acres a year based on that departure analysis. So um, we can set our goals high. We can acknowledge what we're doing now and put in motion the, the planning that's, that's um, there to offer us um, burn windows, opportunities across different environmental, elevational, vegetation type gradients to be able to get fire back in those systems. Um, if we get the planning done, we can request the funding, we can request the people resources, uh, we can work with our partners, um, you know, such as the, the local community, uh, our fire protection districts um, with Keegan, for example, um, our other state agencies to be able to get these projects uh, moving forward. So I don't wanna wait 2000 years. Um, that one slide I put up there with, uh, you know, the research that's really emphasizing more prescribed fire. Um, I, I believe in that. And um, I think in some cases we're gonna, we're, we are gonna get caught up to that. Um, but in other cases, we have to acknowledge uh, where we're gonna be most successful and where we're gonna be least successful at using fire. So we usually start from the communities and work our way out, um, but we need to be thinking bigger um, and not just working around the communities. So um, if anyone knows about the National Cohesive Strategy, uh, it requires uh, all lands, all, all, um, all management uh, to look at uh, all the various uh, private uh, public lands and, and other lands to manage. So it can't just be national forest. It has to start with the communities. They have to do their part. Um, the other fire uh, jurisdictions such as Keegan, as well as the Forest Service, BLM, Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, BIA, et cetera, to, to be getting this scale approach bigger. Um, hopefully that was, that was one answer, one way to answer the question. That was good. Thank you. Um, okay, we have another question. Um, and I don't know if Duncan and Keegan can speak to this because um, a different fire management agency led this, but um, this uh, question is, what were the lessons learned from the Franktown Road burn when the controlled fire got out of control? I'm stick it in the chat. So there was, um, so if I'm reading the question, interpreting it correctly here, um, there was a little valley uh, prescribed fire that escaped um, a few years back. Um, with with that, there was a uh, facilitated learning analysis, which is essentially a review of 
uh, what happened and and what uh, was was needed to uh, address that. Um, and looks like there's some some stuff in the chat on that. I may not be the most appropriate person to answer. Um, I don't have the information in front of me, but I do know that there were some some main points um, considering the planning box. So when we when we plan a prescribed fire, what what's adjacent to that fire? Uh, we don't just look at the 10 acre or 20 acre or 500 acre block that we're burning. We have to look outside of that block and use that fire modeling. Um, and those parameters for when we burn under the right weather conditions, what that fire is going to do. Uh, on the Forest Service side, we, we consider that the worst case scenario. So we model for the worst case scenario. If, if the winds were to be 50 miles per hour, where would the fire go? And then that's, that's how we start, um, start that conversation and, and how we plan. Um, there were other lessons learned, I think, that came out of that in terms of uh, having the appropriate uh, monitoring, holding resources, or contingency resources. So these are the resources that might involve having hand crews uh, or fire engines um, available uh, to be able to mop up or address any fire that might have gone beyond a, a control line or a fire line. So I don't know if there's anyone else um, specific to that instance that wants to answer that question further, but those are those are some of my takeaways. Yeah, and I I like thank you Isaac and and thank you Eric. Um, you, they both put a link to um, the review in the chat. So if you want to read further, you can click on that. Um, I'm gonna to go to the third question. Um, so is the US Forest Service coordinating with any of the groups doing indigenous or cultural burning practices? I would love to see that up here in Tahoe. I don't know if anybody can answer that. Um, so I, I mentioned I used to work in Tahoe um, for the Forest Service, there, there has been a lot, of, a lot of those conversations occurring more recently in the last several years uh, with the Washoe tribe. Um, there is a project on the West Shore, um, trying to remember, it's around Meeks Bay. The, the tribe has some land up in there and, and there, there was a project, um, I think I was even listening to, to one of the presentations on the terrestrial, um, or I'm sorry, traditional ecological um, knowledge conference where they were uh, hand thinning, removing a uh, logical pine that was encroaching upon a meadow and they use uh, follow-up prescribed fire to um, rejuvenate the meadow, um, reduce the, um, the thatch and the, the overgrown vegetation within the meadow to allow for the grasses to um, have that healthy response post-fire. So they did those pre-treatment activities, like I said, with lodgepole pine, thinning that, removing that, and then following it, up, following it up with fire. And it sounds like there's probably more knowledge and experts here in the crowd than, than uh, myself here. So I'm just looking at the chat. There's some good, good stuff being posted. There Can is. I insert myself for a sec. I've, um, not to plug living with fire any more than... We're doing right now but we did just uh put out a we released a podcast this year we started doing a podcast and our we did an episode about the Maya Alawata restoration project and interviewed two scientists from the tribe so I'm going to put that link in the chat for anyone who has wants to maybe learn more about that great thanks Megan okay um Next question, for the general public that doesn't already own land needing treatment, how can we help with U.S. Forest Service fuels reduction efforts on forestry land? So I think this is a, um, like a volunteer question. Am, am I understanding that correctly? It sounds to me, yeah, like they're... 
Oh yeah. Um, you know, just kind of thinking about this, you know, the, the public support is really important. Um, the, the messaging, uh, working with other community members, your homeowners association, um, local, you know, local environmental groups, local interest groups, whatever, um, offering that support, I think helps out a lot. Um, we do our best that one of the big, big things that I see when we, when we use, um, prescribed fire, um, is, is we can get shut down pretty quickly, uh, by one single smoke complaint. Um, so air quality is always, is always a big, um, issue in, in the urban interface and trying to meet that air quality standards is, is key. And so we, we have a responsibility, uh, as agencies to, um, mitigate any and all smoke impacts to our best and also meet the requirements of, of the Clean Air Act. But we also have to recognize that um, a short four hour pulse of smoke is far better than the several weeks and months that we've seen, um, especially this last summer of, of air quality that's um, in the unhealthy or even hazardous range. So um, I think it's just being involved in your community, um, providing that support, uh, showing up to these types of events and other local community events, um, I think is, in my opinion, one of the most helpful things we can do. And Doug, I could add to that, um, within the WUI specifically, where I concentrate, you know, and, and, and up here in Tahoe, where we have a lot of vacant lots that are owned by the Forest Service or by the state, there are programs out there for a homeowner. Um, and the way I'm reading this question is, is my, my property is good, but how can I help the Forest Service with theirs? And there are programs on my other side of my hat, I'm a defensible space inspector and I go out to a lot of these neighboring lots of Forest Service um, that will never be built on. They're great places to live. However, the Forest Service do, can get behind on treating those urban lots. So there are programs, talk to your local fire jurisdiction and there are programs to allow you to go onto that lot and treat it as, is, as it, if it was your own, following some guidelines, of course. Thanks, Keegan. Thanks, Duncan. Um, okay, next question. Um, I was told that if you have a U.S. Forest Service lot near you, you can apply for a free permit to do some thinning there if needed. Given how much the U.S. Forest Service has on its plate right now, would this be good info to get out there? I think after Caldor, people would be happy and willing to help clear lots near them. Um, so it's kind of kind of answered that. Um, yeah, Jamie, I also just um, put in the chat a link to a document that has that information and the contact info for who to call about getting um, an agreement with the Forest Service. Awesome. Thanks, Amanda. I appreciate it. Okay. Um, next question. When you talk about chipping, are you carting away the chip or leaving it? Um, Keegan, this might be for you, but... Um, you know, Duncan, if you can add to, um, we'd welcome it as well. Yeah, so again, I'll speak for my district and the, and the district surrounding, um, surrounding the, the, the basin here. Um, we generally take it with us. Now, um, on large scale chipping sites, we may broadcast it and distribute it evenly kind of across the forest floor. Uh, but generally when I'm coming up or my guys are coming up to your your neighborhood and they're chipping your curbside pile that you put out for us uh, we're generally taking it with us we don't want you to take that fuel and then put it you know against the house um, it does rearrange the fuel chip doesn't burn with great intensity um, but it's still it's still flammable so we don't want it near the houses so we generally take it with us and put it in a safe spot i wish i wish we had better utilization of it um, however that's a different story all in together but we generally take it with us if you're dealing with the local fire department. Duncan, do you have anything to add on the larger scale broadcast, uh, larger scale chipping? Project? Yeah, I, I, I think it, it kind of falls to the scale 
conversation again, you know, like um, in, in many instances, at least on national forest and, and, and if it's outside of Lake Tahoe Basin, I'll be speaking to that. Um, a lot of times the chipping is used as a primary treatment to address some of the uh, shrub or smaller trees. And so it, it's, it's pretty much on a, on a smaller scale if you're looking at um, using a chipper by the roadside. In, in some places we actually use a tracked chipper that um, has a remote control and we can walk it through the forest. And um, we've used that you know, on a scale of, you know, anywhere from a few acres to a couple hundred acres. So chipping generally, we want it, um, we, we broadcast it um, and make sure it's spread out in the forest. Easier to, to broadcast it than it is to remove it at that scale. I think at a smaller scale, it's maybe it's good to, to remove it. Um, we've gone into some areas where we can't burn the piles. Um, or piles that have been sitting for a while and used our track chipper to, uh, to munch those piles down and, and uh, move on to the next area. We have another um, related question. Um, to treat 100,000 acres per year with prescribed fire will include a need to mechanically reduce stems per acre on a large scale. Getting machines on steeper slopes can include tethered mechanized harvesting. Will the forest plan be flexible to using tethered me mechanized equipment on the Comstop logging roads? Um, if, if we're talking about the environmental assessment that we're going through on the Humboldt Toyabi, um, we, we do have the ability to, um, you know, use um, some of these, these treatment options. Um, we, we have to consider the economics of it as well. Um, some of these systems actually might be costing, you know, over a thousand dollars per acre, and that minimizes the number of acres we treat. Um, you know, I, I think in in many cases the you know the the budget budget thing is is it just depends on where you work um, and what kind of funding you have. But if we want to treat big acres, uh, we may, we may have to prioritize all those various treatments, like I mentioned. Uh, in conjunction with prescribed fire. So we use, we use all the tools in the toolbox, as they say. And in some cases, um, if the, the, the location is advantageous and we have the equipment, we have the contractors and there's some economics in it, um, removing uh, some of the biomass fuels, trees, et cetera, through um, you know, mechanized logging, uh, cable logging, tethering, et cetera, um, can, can work out pretty well. Um, but it, it all has to factor into our, our budgets and the economics of it as well. And, and if you just want to look at the, the track record or, or the, this concept, um, it, yes, it has been done, but it hasn't been done a lot and it does cost um, a, a pretty good amount to get it done. Okay. Um, next question is, what's the attitude of environmentalists on prescribed fire? Okay, so I have some thoughts there. I, I'm an environmentalist myself. Um, I care about the environment that I live in and, and, and the ecosystem and, and having a healthy forest for the future. Um, I kind of skirt around this question a little bit here because I think there's a lot of um, differing thoughts. Um, you know, we have local community members, you know, also have that same um, philosophy in, in their environment, in their, you know, where they live in the forest. So the environmentalists overall, um, it just depends on where you go and where you work. Um, if you're looking at environmentalists from the environmental um, obstruction industry, then then I would say that 
um, prescribed fire is generally a pretty, um, pretty white hat accepted practice. People generally don't like to see burned trees though. Um, and so um, I would make the case, and, and this is kind of going back to the scale and the different working environment. Um, you know, Keegan's burning, you know, in the urban interface and, and he's, he's doing burns where aesthetics is really important. Um, when we burn out in the middle of Nevada, um, people are gonna see some burned dead trees and in many cases, the, the snapshot in time post fire, people see that and they don't, they don't realize what things look like two years, three years, five years later. Um, and so that's the picture I want people to start looking at. Um, you know, I've seen some areas out north of Reno that we've done some understory burning and the uh, arrow leaf balsam root and the lupin and the, the grasses come back with, with force. And before, before we did that burn, there was five inches of pine needle duff, um, not allowing any of those uh, understory native species to come up. So um, skirting around the question and then also answering it directly, it's just gonna vary, but prescribed fire has been a very accepted practice by many environmentalists. Good answer. Um, next question. I've been asked how the timber industry can help. What is the timber industry's role in fuel reduction? I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'll stick it in the chat. Just take a look here in the chat as well. So the timber industry, um, they have a role. Um, this, the industry itself, it, go, it falls in line with some of the pretreatment that we need to get done before we can use fire. So fuels reduction treatments, forest health thinning treatments. Um, it, it's not a one size fits all approach. Um, in some cases, you know, we're looking at a, a landscape where we want to provide some diversity across some regeneration of pine trees. Um, we want to provide diverse habitats, regeneration of aspen species. Uh, we need to do thinning. We need to do, in some cases, actual uh, logging, and we need an industry to utilize that material to find a use for it, um, remove it from the site. So if we absolutely had no industry, if we had no logging equipment, um, we wouldn't be able to, to thin the forests or provide, um, you know, provide any kind of uh, economy, um, cost reduction, um, forest product that might fit within meeting those objectives. So our first step is looking at the objectives of the project and then using that infrastructure that we have in place um, in the logging industry to help where it fits within our, our objectives, uh, using that industry to, to assist with the project. So primary objective in my mind is forest health, fuels reduction for the communities. Um, logging industry definitely has a role. Uh, primary objective to log timber um, in order to provide forest products. Uh, there's a lot of private land, industry land there, and that is also a viable objective. But the, in the Forest Service side of things, we do have lands that are set aside for um, you know, timber production, and then we also have those other lands that um, we want to meet those other uh, forest health objectives in. Okay, um, another question. Is there some advantage um, this year to going in first and downing trees to space them out without making the piles in order to save time and cover a large area, then come back later to do piles? 
given the drought cutting thinning trees now before and during uh oh i just lost it i'm sorry um where did i go now before and during a potential dry winter would help the remaining trees survival better i'll, I'll take a stab at this one um <clears throat> So when we go down, when we when we first start a project, um, we're taking down trees, we're taking down tall brush. Uh, depending on what kind of crew formation you're doing, um, we will sometimes let those cure out on the ground and come back and pile them. However, when you're taking down uh, fuels, as you mentioned here, uh, I feel like you know you're obviously killing that 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 vegetation. And now it's going to sit and cure out, which is what we want. But now you've kind of maybe covered the forest floor with with receptive fuel beds. And I'd hate, you know, yes, we've rearranged the fuels somewhat. And that's basically what we're doing when we're piling. However, if you leave a, a what we call a surface fuel on the bed of a forest floor and in a large landscape, I'm not sure that would be the best beneficial use of our time. I think piling, piling them, um, again, rearranging that fuel um, gets it, you know, it cures fine in a pile. Um, what we saw on the um, the uh, recent Caldor fire here, as it kind of dripped down into the basin, is there was a lot of piles at, up at the top of Echo Summit. Um, they had done a lot of road work up there and made a lot of piles. And when the fire came, uh, the fire front, if you will, when the fire front came, it really didn't add to the uh, intensity of the fire. Yeah, we had little pockets of heat where those piles were now being consumed by a wildfire, but because it was rearranged in piles, and, and generally when we make those piles, they're in a wide open area, they're not affecting the residual trees that we did decide to leave up, so they were relatively safe. Now, if those fuels were scattered and weren't processed and piled together, it'd be all laying on the floor and that fire front would probably come with higher veracity. But it's a it's a good point. We are we are in a stage where we're starting to thinking outside the box. You know, resources are low, and and the fuels are getting bigger and more more so out there. Just maybe add one one point to that. That I'm when I'm reading the question and thinking about how it plays out too is um, one of the advantage of of piling those fuels is that um, the the tops and the limbs from any of the trees that we cut and pile, the, the needles dry out. Those are the, the smaller size fuels in that pile. If we have those, those uh, you know, cured needles, uh, limbs and tops in the pile, we can get that pile to burn during the winter time. If we were just to lop and scatter those trees um, leave them on the ground. All those, all those fine fuels, uh, needles, tops, limbs. Um, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to recover those to put those back into a pile. Um, and in some cases, like in burning around uh, the community, if we're just burning big, you know, fourteen-inch logs, those are not going to consume enough, and, and what's going to be left behind is a bunch of um, half-burned uh, logs that are just sitting there. I have a quick follow-up question while we're on this topic. This is Megan. I think that another aspect of this question had to do with drought mitigation is, would that be, um, I think that you explained the reason why you don't just leave uh, down logs in the forest, but is sort of removing healthy trees in uh, preparation for like a dry season, is that a drought mitigation tactic that works? I think that was the other part of the question that I'm curious about as well. Maybe if I'm if I'm under if I'm understanding correctly, um, you know the the act of thinning. Um, you know, generally when we thin, we're thinning the suppressed or intermediate um, crown class trees or the, the less healthy trees, um, principles of, of good fuels reduction are to leave the, the larger, uh, healthier trees, thick bark that can withstand fire. 
So when we when we do the act of thinning, there is an immediate benefit to the the residual trees that we leave behind. Um, most people look above ground, but if if you were to actually look below ground, which is really hard, um, you could see a, a giant network of tree roots. Um, all competing for, for soil space um, and the water that's in the soil. So if, 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 if I'm looking at that question correctly, um, yes, there's an immediate benefit. Um, that benefit, um, you know, can be realized, um, you know, in a short period of time as well. Generally, trees will respond to that changed environment with less competition and more soil water uh, within a couple of years, you can see that in the growth rings. I think that's exactly what uh, what they're asking. Thanks, Duncan. Thanks, Duncan. Um, I am going to share the poll because um, we're going to run out of time, but um, we are still going to answer, ask and answer questions um, while we have the poll up. So, um, this first poll is just asking um, gender, ethnicity, and race. Um, you don't have to answer it, um, but we we just really want to make sure that we're reaching our audience and um, proportionally. Um, we, we'd like to know that we're reaching people um, correctly. So um, it is anonymous. Um, you, do, you don't have to answer, but we do appreciate it. Um, we do need to put this in um, federal reports. Okay, so the next question is, what about using sheep and goats to reduce some of the grasses? Yes, They're, they are another, another tool in the toolbox. Um, and so considering all the, the factors in a, in a certain area, the type of vegetation, uh, the type of fuels that would burn. Um, we, we do use some level of targeted grazing uh, to target both fine fuels or in some places um, targeting the removal for uh, cheatgrass. So um, we're working with UNR and other partners right now and in, in some studies and some demonstrations in order to um, see how, how grazing using livestock can be used um, to treat fuels and then also meet some of those other objectives by actually removing uh, some of those invasive annuals and allowing the, the native plants to, you know, kind of gain hold and in that environment um, reduce competition with the invasive weeds as well. So, um, Couple examples of that um, for folks around the, the Reno, Carson City area. Um, there's work that's going on, has been going on for actually over 10 years uh, using sheep in the urban interface um, around um, you know, kind of that Mount Rose uh, highway corridor up against Reno, uh, all the way up on the west side of Carson City in the, in the hills. And then more recently, there's some work um, couple thousand acres of, of grazing. It actually, I think, might be happening right now around Jack's Valley area. Um, and it's, it's a great tool. Um, the sheep come in um, a lot easier than uh, cattle in some cases because cattle may require uh, fencing or a cowboy. Uh, the sheep um, move into an area. Um, we can get them in and out, and they're generally pretty easy to use and utilize. Thanks, Duncan. Um, it looks like um, Eric Gavin has a, a Kayvon has a question, um, and he raised his hand. And then um, did he go away? I'm trying to see, Eric, if you're there, did you want to talk? No, that 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 was fine. I was just going to add. I know uh, Keegan. We had a lot of uh, good experience with uh, some some goats use of goats within. Um, uh, the Tahoe Basin and out in Glenbrook. And uh, it, it was really good to see that they not only ate the grasses, but um, the uniqueness to goats is they also will eat a lot of the brush and the shrubs. Um, and so it really gets rid of those ladder fuels. And so um, I think, you know, in lieu of having smoke and that type of stuff and, and, and uh, you know, uh, all the um, 
disadvantages of having uh, the disturbance of a fuel crew working on that area, uh, the goats are uh, a natural way to address some of those issues. Um, and they're less, less invasive in that sense. Thank you. And, and, and this is the time for grazing animals to come out and eat that cheatgrass. It is green and ripe and ready for the eating. Um, okay, another question. We have a U.S. Forest Service lot behind us in a residential area. Dead trees were fallen this spring. Everything was just left. What is left behind is bark, pine cones from years, pine needles, branches, and logs. What is most flammable? Are there any funds to provide a dumpster to take these items away? Volunteers will do the work. So, Jamie, I think I, I saw this question and, and I'd like to add my two cents on it. I don't know where um, Joan resides or if or where her fire district is. And, and Amanda could help me out with this as well. But um, there are programs, I know specifically in the basin, that there are funding um, green waste dumpsters essentially. Now, with the earlier question about how do I clean up forest service lots, of course you want you know that permission slip essentially before you make access and take anything off of those lands. However, there are programs that will um, allow volunteers to do the work and, and clean up some of those forest service lots that uh, have been neglected, especially when they're within the WUI and, and you're a neighboring on those. Um, specifically, I know that, uh, that, that I have budgeted for a, a a dump trailer, which I know a lot of fire departments are looking at this route to basically deliver to your neighborhood and uh, neighbors and yourself can clean up your lot, maybe adjacent lots, put it in the uh, dump trailer and we'll come and haul it off for you. So there are options I know specifically in Tahoe Basin and Amanda can um, can uh, continue with that if she'd like, but I, she kind of manages some of that funding that could make those green waste uh, dumpsters available. So it looks like Joan lives in Carnelian Bay Ridgewood, Ridgewood subdivision. Yeah, so Carnelian Bay is definitely um, within uh, the, the, the technique network of teamwork we got going here. And, and she would contact uh, North Tahoe Fire to get more information on maybe getting some of that help. Yeah, Keegan, thanks for that. Um, I was just going to echo that, that she should contact North Tahoe Fire Protection District, and there might be some availability for a green waste dumpster, depending on where they're at with that. Yep, Eric Hornvet. Oh, he's on here. Hey, Eric. Thanks, Eric. <laughs> so, Joan, if you see it, it's in the chat. Um, just contact Eric, and he left his email. Um, for those folks who are in the state of Nevada, if you have any of those questions, um, you can you know, I, I can help you see if there's a, a green waste event in your region. Um, and um, there's other, you know, if, if you have problems reaching out to your local agency, I can help you um, with the contact. Um, I also put up the post workshop poll, it just measures what you learned. Um, if this was useful, um, it really helps us um, know uh, if you if you liked it. Uh, it's very useful. Your results will not be shared. It is anonymous. Um, so if, if folks could please fill that out, it'd be greatly appreciated. So I'm going to go back to some more questions. Um, okay. Here it, it is. Return fire interval has been an important concept for using prescribed fire. Is there a planning effort to reintroduce prescribed understory broadcasts understory fire on to old burn areas. So yeah, like in, I guess, uh, if I'm understanding correctly, like in areas that have burned before either a wildfire or a prescribed fire, um, it's going to just depend on, on that vegetation type and, and the ecosystem that we're looking at. Um, I kind of mentioned earlier, like just very generally, like, you know, the, the forest types of, you know, across the elevation gradients. Um, and so like in a pine, in a pine forest ecosystem, Jeffrey pine, ponderosa pine, um, it's probably a good idea to have fire in there, you know, sometime around every 20 years, but it's just going to depend on the site, the environment, the uh, fuels, uh, 
that accumulate. Um, and so we, we do look at those areas and, and those actually, once a fire does burn through an area, um, reduces the fuels, it's actually easier to put prescribed fire back in those areas in the future um, because there's some, some level of uh, maintenance that's involved. Um, and those, those are uh, areas where we have good benefit. Jamie, I think you're on mute. Sorry, my dog was about to bark, so I had to mute myself. Um, we have about uh, three more questions. Are you guys willing to stick around for those few questions to be answered? You okay, Duncan? We have sure. to go to another meeting. Okay. Um, uh, this looks like a, a, a comment. Uh, back in the 40s and the 50s, the basin was used for summer grazing by valley ranchers for sheep and cattle. I don't remember extreme fire during those years. Granted, we had more snow. However, could these animals assist now? Um, talked about that a little bit. I'm a firm believer that they can do great things up here in the basin as, as they once did. I'm also a firm believer that our climate has drastically changed up here in, in, in the basin. So we're gonna see more drastic fires. Um, but I do um, on a smaller scale, again, the way I work, looking at my district specifically, uh, like Eric had mentioned earlier, we uh, brought in some goats and uh, they did great work. I thought they were only for grass and grazing, that type of area. Uh, but as Eric said, you know, they're really getting some of that real woody type of um, brush, which is the surface fuel, which is primarily, you know, my my biggest concern is that surface fuel leading up to home. So we had them out in Glenbrook and they did great work. And I agree with this comment um, that they should be utilized more. OK, next question. Has anyone tried burying the pruned wood? No. Yeah, I'm not sure what that is. Um, I'm not either, um, but um, we will, if, if whoever asked that question, did you have something further to add to that question? Yes, I, I, this is Mary Wall. I, I did ask that question. Um, I meant something like hugel culture, where you, you bury the wood and it, it doesn't release the um, carbon into the atmosphere like burning does. Um, I know it's more expensive, but, um, you know, have you ever, you know, uh, tested it or um, in some areas it might work well? I don't know. I always like to consider like new ideas and new thoughts and see how they play out. Um, Are you familiar in, with uh, hugel culture? Um, no, I am not. Okay, that's where you bury trees and you, um, um, you know, they can take 20, 25 years to um, degrade, but if you put that under a garden, so to speak, um, it will uh, improve the water content and uh, and also um, you, you don't have the, the smoke or the or or the carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere when you do have a burn you know of the piles or whatever yeah so. what, what i would what i would think that might be involved in the process is actually um extra steps at oh, yeah. um how we might be so when we add extra steps or extra process, that then adds extra cost or extra time to addressing, you know, the, the fuels or the objectives that we're looking to accomplish. Um, and we're also in a, in, in a dry uh, forest type uh, where we live. Um, so not to say that that might not be viable, but it's, I think it's something we'd have to consider is um, if indeed that material would break down. Um, in some cases, we, we don't want to keep on adding more uh, material to the soils as well. Um, 
but I think I'm going to start Googling that and looking into it. Um, okay, great. That sounds, that sounds <laughs> uh, it, if, uh, yeah, it's called Hugo culture. It's, um, I've, it's a German name, I think. So. It looks like gardening somebody, a, somebody put gardening it on the question. Sorry. Oh, there it is. Just Googled it, Hugo culture. So. Interesting concept. Yeah, some um, of the, uh, the, there's a school garden here in um, South Lake Tahoe um, at Bijou School, and they have a lot of raised beds with vegetables growing in it, and um, it, um, it's all based on some, you know, there's some wood and logs underneath all of those raised beds, and I'm a master gardener, so that's why I'm promoting it. <laughs> so. Interesting. Well, thanks, yeah. Mary. Uh -huh. Okay, last question. Is there any interest in improving demand for forest products such as biochar or biofuels or cross laminated timber as a new industrial development for our geographic area? Boy, I, well, I just, I, I, I wanted to, because I thought of the last question and I was thinking, you know, utilization of, uh, of these forest products, it, it, it's constantly on our mind. You know, I don't, I don't want to burn the piles. I, I'd rather that go to a homeowner. I'd rather that go to some sort of process. And uh, although I've never heard of hugo culture, um, heard of biochar, and I think it's a great product. Um, and and again, just thinking, how do we utilize this stuff? It's just a matter of getting it out of the woods. is is very non cost effective. Uh, but I do believe in bio biochar specifically and, and how that can be utilized, especially for my local area, the, the Lake Tahoe Basin. Um, but I'm racking my brain on on how we get this stuff out cost effectively. You know, that's why it all goes up in smoke is because we just can't get it off the mountain. Um, but I'm a firm believer. I saw the word biochar and I got excited. Um, and, 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 you know, as a community, we need to start thinking that way. How do we better utilize this stuff? You know, it's it's there for the taking. We can't have it near the homes. How do we utilize it better? There's no mills that take the wood anywhere from the basin that would be cost effective. Um, I don't know about, you know, in Duncan's ground where he manages it, but um, I'm constantly thinking that and I encourage, you know, ideas on how to how to utilize some of this stuff. Great. Um, thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you, speakers. Um, thank you, Amanda. Thank you, other partners who showed up to, to help answer questions. Um, I think that this was a really awesome presentation. And um, if you have any other questions that you want answered, um, if you think about it later on, you could always email us at lwf at unr.edu. Um, and either Megan or myself will answer, and um, we'll try to find that question for you. Thank you again. Um, I'm going to, actually the, the poll is ended. So um, thanks for sticking around this eight minutes, everybody. See ya.